and welcome to geologic timeline. So this is what everything has been kind of surmounting to when we've been talking about absolute age dating, relative age dating, fossils and things like that. It's so that we have the understanding of how and why we are able to take all of the information we know, the fossils that we find, um, other things like that, and how we can tell it's been 4.6 billion years in the making up until this point. Um, how we're able to break down our timeline into different eons, eras, periods, and epochs, um, things like that. So this is going to be a long one, only because we're literally trying to take 4.6 billion years and shove it into one PowerPoint. So um, notes will take probably two days or so, not a big deal. Um, so just prepare with me. Okay. So we are working with middle school earth science standard 1-4 and middle school life science standard 4-1, which states that you will be able to construct a scientific explanation based on evidence from rock strata for how the geologic timescale is used to organize earth's 4.6 billion year old history. And we are able to do that with the use of Life Science Standard 4-1, which states that you will analyze and interpret data for patterns in the fossil record that document the existence, diversity, extinction, and change of life forms throughout the history of life on Earth under the assumption that natural laws operate today as they did in the past. Here's what you're going to be able to do by the end of all of this. You are going to be able to define the units of geologic time. You're going to be able to define what an extinction truly is, but then also explain why the Precambrian era is so important. Um, the Precambrian era is huge. So to understand why it was so long and why it is so important is very, it's necessary for you to know. So let's see. Please make sure that you have your at least whole group notes out in front of you, um, if not all of your notes, depending on which form you chose. And let's get going. So geologic time, um, we need to understand the units. So we use the difference between seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years um, in order to define essentially all that we are today. Um, in geologic time, even years aren't long enough. So going from the longest period of time, how like if you were to think of a millennia or a century, um, things like that, when we're talking geologic time, that is an equivalent to an eon. An eon is the longest unit of time. We are then able to take eons and subdivide them down into eras. So there's multiple eras that make up an eon. That would be like if we're thinking eon as millennia, we're thinking era as century. Or you can think of it as century and then decades or things like that. Um, period. So these would be subdivisions of eras. And then finally, epochs. These are subdivisions of periods, meaning we go from eon to era to period to epoch. The further we go down this list, the more finite and closer we get to actual or absolute age dating versus something happening within an eon is like saying, well, World, World War II happened within the last hundred years. Yes, but you're not telling me anything. So those are your units, eon, era, period, epoch. So we don't actually divide up our geologic timeline thanks to um, like very particular years um, or a set amount of years. So like we know that a decade is 10 years. So it's like the, 80, the decade of the 80s, the 90s, like all that kind of stuff. No, we don't do that um, with this. We actually only define the difference in um, eons and eras and epochs and all that kind of fun jazz through a response to change. Typically, that response to change is mass extinction. Now, before you're like, oh my god, this is going to get so dark and gloomy. Uh, yeah, it probably is, but... 
we have to understand that mass extinction is the greatest response to change. Um, so because typically it's a change in climate, it's a change in geologic like features and being able to get from one point to another feeding ground to breeding ground sort of a thing. It's also a response to evolution. Without extinction, we can't have any sort of evolution in any organisms because we would allow the weak to survive versus getting rid of the weak and only being left with the strong that can truly go through and change something about it. Um, we have to understand though that because we're looking at 4.6 billion years worth of information, things are ever evolving. We didn't think that humans were really a thing until maybe a million years ago. Um, typically you hear around that like 65,000 or 65 million years ago, 65, yeah. Something like that. Six, <laughs> um, 65 million years ago after the extinction of the dinosaurs and things like that. We had Neanderthals and things like that, but like actual humans um, versus there's new evidence that we've potentially been on this planet since 1.8 million years ago um, or 180 million years ago. Sorry, 180 million years ago. There's so much more that we're still trying to figure out. There's always room for error and there's error and there's always room for change. So as of now, with the information that I have readily available to me, um, this is how we are going to say the geologic timeline plays out. Okay. Now, once there's new information, we will talk about changing things. But here's what I know. Here's the geologic time scale. We have from the top is where we currently are. So we are within the Holocene. Um, and then as you follow it down, technically, we are a part of the Quaternary period, which is a part of the Cenozoic era, which is a part of the Phanerozoic eon, um, things like that. But there's really only been one other eon prior to this, and that is the Precambrian eon. Um, and yeah, it's so cool to kind of talk about it and to think like this is how everything is broken down. We're going to talk about all of the periods um, throughout this, which then hits all of the eras. Um, the ones that we're not going to talk about are the Pennsylvanian and the Mississippian, and that's because they're highly debated, clearly. Um, typically, when it comes to talking like scientific fact that involves the entire earth, we don't name it something that would be very U.S. focused. So, okay, so that's kind of where we're at. So let's start with the Precambrian era. This is the Precambrian eon, the Precambrian era, kind of however you want to talk it. We're going to talk about it as the Precambrian time because so much happened. Now, this picture is somewhat deceiving because you're like, oh, gee, that's not that much time. Um, we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is the Precambrian time. So that is all of this. This is just the best picture I could find for the Precambrian. Everything else happened after the Precambrian, only 542 million years ago. The Precambrian starts 4.6 billion years ago, and it goes up until about 542 million years ago. To start this off, the Precambrian era, the Precambrian eon, whatever you want to call it, is about 90% of all of Earth's history. Most of what we know about Earth happened during this time period. So it starts when we have our first geologic history, which is about 4.6 billion years ago. Now you're like, gee, 
You told us back in astronomy that the Earth is 4.8 billion years old. Well, yes, the Earth is, but our actual geologic record is only 4.6. Well, what happened to those 2 million years? Or 200 million years, 200 million years ago? What happened was the Earth, when it was formed 4.8 billion years ago, was a giant ball of magma. So we can't have a geologic record in something that wasn't solid. So yes, Earth is 4.8 billion years old, but our geologic record only goes back 4.6 because that is the earliest evidence we have of a solid Earth. Okay, so from 4.6 billion years all the way to 541 million years is when the Precambrian era occurred. This is where all life started to emerge. Now, when we think of all life, it's not what you think of. Um, we were 100% water bound um, and not even like water like you would think of it. Um, but only about 3.5 billion years ago do we get our first true evidence of life and it's algae. So I know I make this comment often, like humans really suck. We ought to all go back to being algae. And that's because that was the last time we were useful. During this time, because of algae, is when we start seeing multicellular life be able to come and form. Um, and then we started changing the earth to where it was a positive to support multicellular organisms. About 600 million years ago, so during the late Precambrian, the first multicellular organism occurred. And again, it was just another form of algae. So the top fossil is an example of what the earliest form looked like, where it is technically just one cell. It's a very elongated cell, but it's a long cell um, that has since been fossilized. And then the bottom picture is what finally came about during the late Precambrian era. And that is more of like an algae you would think of or like a, a water plant that you would think of. And this is crucial, okay? So because we have to understand that the Precambrian environment was very, very hostile. Um, hostile not for a newborn planet but hostile for multicellular organisms um rock layers indicate that there were a range of environments during this time now they are we have range of environments now as well but we have evidence that the atmosphere was mainly made up of these four gases methane ammonia mineral uranite and pyrite well pyrite is fool's gold We've already figured that out. Um, methane typically is like gas. Um, gas, what I mean like body gas release sort of a thing. Um, ammonia, you clean your floors with it and it doesn't smell good. Um, mineral uranite, I just know that uranite doesn't sound good. So yeah, um, very hostile toward oxygen breathing organisms. So the really cool thing and why I say we need to go back to being algae is because we then transformed our atmosphere. Because algae is plant, we know that they t plants take in really disgusting gases and expel amazing gases from multicellular organisms. So blue algae starts out photos photosynthesis. Um, you still have plenty of sun coming in, running when it needs to run. It's taking in all of this methane, ammonia, uranite, pyrite, all that kind of fun jazz. And then it's expelling things like oxygen, nitrogen, things like that. That is so important towards supporting larger life. So the oceans, which started to contain like volcanic um, derived phosphorus iron, hematite, we, only because Ms. Kerber, hematite, rock, iron, my desk kind of is made out of it, and all this 
to where we start because of all of the like photosynthesis happening, eukaryotes about 1.8 billion years ago were able to bring the ocean oxygen levels up to up 10%. Oxygen was starting to fill our oceans, which is important because then it stops looking really, really green and really, really gross and starts turning blue. And that then has an effect on our atmosphere. So, uh, do, 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 do. so to be fair, this is how the earth changed about 3.85 billion years ago, um, the earth itself was only about zero degrees Celsius, which is freezing by the way. Um, it is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Fast forward 3 billion years or 300 million years and we start looking at a seven degree increase. That is huge. You're like, oh, seven degrees, not that bad. Seven degrees is the difference between freezing and life. So once the temperatures in our atmosphere were able to increase seven degrees or up to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, evolution and life could flourish. And now I know, like, I thought it's really somber and like, oh, poetic about it. That's because this is why the Precambrian era is so important. Because without those single cellular algae that were able to grow and become multicellular algae, we were able to completely transform our oceans. We were able to then transform our atmosphere. And this is all important because without that transformation of both, larger life could not live. So the Precambrian era gives us new hope for what life could turn into and what life did turn into. That's it for whole group. <laughs> so if you're going to stick with me, fantastic. If not, not a big deal. Um, you're watching the whole group notes anyway. You're not watching the whole thing. So sweet. Awesome. Remember um, to be respectful um, if you're in class listening to this. And yeah, awesome. Uh, let's continue on if you're continuing on with me in the PowerPoint. The Paleozoic Era. So worse comes to worse. <laughs> with that seven degree increase in our atmosphere, with the oxygen levels rising 10%, um, a lot of life died. Um, quite a bit of life died between the Paleoz or the um, Precambrian into the Paleozoic era. Um, but not necessarily for the worse. So the the weak die off, but the strong continue to live. During the Cambrian and the Ordovician periods, this is where we become the age of invertebrates. Now remember back to last year, invertebrate meaning no spine, no vertebrae. So these are all water bound, um, exoskeleton, crustacean sort of things, but you can see it's getting larger. All life was still in the ocean at this point in time because the water was just far more suitable. I mean, if you imagine like being a worm versus being like this lobster looking thing in the ocean, um, we were doing really well being lobster things in the ocean. So this is the early Paleozoic. So Cambrian period is 542 million years to 488 million years ago. And then it leads into the Ordovician, um, which is 488 to 444 million years ago. And then you enter into the Silurian, the Silurian, Silurian, Silurian. We'll get to that. So at the end of the Ordovician period and the beginning of the Pale um, during the Paleozoic era, um, so about 440 million years ago, 85% of all life was lost. 
we call this the Ordovician mass extinction. So at the end of the Ordovician era, um, sorry, period, I'm going to get those confused and I really, really apologize. Um, we lose 85% of all life. So if you think of our team as having 100 learners, um, only 15 survived this one. Okay. Um, suspected causes um, because of like continents actually kind of sort of sort of forming so continental drift occurring um which again releases quite a bit of toxins into the water because at those divergent zones you have um more um mantle coming up and meeting and cooling and just all this kind of fun jazz um which then led to a subsequent climate change um one thing we don't always think about is that when we have certain land masses in different areas it either helps increase the temperature or decrease the temperature. So just the idea of having Antarctica as cold it is, as it is, is so necessary to keep the balance within our atmosphere because you have that really, really cold spot that's constantly cold versus the really warm spots towards the center. Um, so depending on where the continents were starting to form depended on then whether there was an increase in temperature or a decrease in temperature. Um, and basically what it comes down to is the loss of sea organisms was because they couldn't adapt. They weren't able to adapt as quickly as they needed to. And because you have an atmosphere forming, there's a lot more water going up as a vapor into the atmosphere, meaning that there just was less water, um, liquid water available for organisms to survive. So overcrowding, things like that. Um, so yeah, 85% of all life, that's a lot, not the most, but it's a lot. The middle Paleozoic, this is like the Silurian and the Devonian periods. These are the age of fish. Um, during the middle Paleozoic, animals began to evolve to the edges of land. Um, so we start seeing plants and insects, um, and things like that. But this is where vertebrates kind of took off. It's like, oh, now I'm really strong after that Ordovician extinction um, to where they're like, we need to get bigger and stronger to be able to eat and take down the prey necessary um, for our survival. And then things got so confident in themselves, the plants started leeching their way up onto land instead of staying in the ocean. And then you start seeing insects. So like those crustaceans eventually start kind of slithering out. Gross, but that's how it worked. Um, we have proof of major collisions between continents during the Middle Paleozoic era. This is where we get a lot of mountain building occurring. Um, I believe it is the, not the Himalayan, I, I can't remember the name of the mountain range, but it's between us and Europe, essentially. Um, they date back to about this time period, so that's kind of big. Um, so yeah, that's the Middle Paleozoic. Then we get the Devonian mass extinction, because again, things are going really, really great, which means now we got a done. Um, the end of the Devonian uh, period of the Paleozoic, so about 375 million years ago, um, because of the continental drifts and all that kind of stuff, major volcanic eruptions, possible meteor strikes, all that kind of stuff, um, we believe that there was a lack of oxygen because so many organisms were fish at that point in time um, that they needed quite a bit of oxygen in order to actually survive. Um, and with the lack of oxygen, it also brought on cooler temperatures um, to where they just they weren't able to adapt or stabilize um, to what was new. Um, it happened very, very quickly after the Ordovician. Um, you'll notice that mass extinctions start to kind of sort of spread out um, after this. Um, so scientists are they can only assume it's because of a really quick climate change that occurred that would lead to 80% of life wiped out. Um, but because we're starting to get vertebrates, uh, we get really cool fossils left behind. Um, really kind of dark. 
I didn't realize how dark my humor was until this unit. Um, but the picture, <laughs> um, in the thing, in the, under the 80% of lives wiped out, um, that, is, that is, that is a sample of sandstone that has all those fish, um, somewhat small organisms, but still getting quite large compared to what we've had in the past. Um, but that's a sample from the Devonian mass extinction. So, yay! Late Paleozoic. So we're coming up on the end of our Paleozoic era. Um, during this time, we get Carboniferous and the Permian period. This is the time of Pangaea. Um, we know this as the age of amphibians, so frogs, um, slug, not slugs, um, salamanders, things like that. And that's because life is starting to figure out the difference between do I want to be in the water? Do I want to be on land? What do I want? I need a little bit of both because evolution takes a long, long time to actually occur. Um, Fish-like organisms begin living partly on land and in the ocean, and this is where we get a dense tropical forest um, in cooler swamps. So if you were to imagine, like, the super duper, like, dense rainforests within South America, but up in, like, Florida. Um, sort of swampy lands. Um, the Carboniferous era is um, period is actually very very big um, because this is what actually started to create all of our fossil fuels. So because we're getting large carbon-based life forms on Earth, i.e., trees, as the picture shows, and other plant matter, um, now that they have essentially burned down because you'll see why here in a minute um that sort of a stuff and then um compressed between layers of sediment that's where we get our now fossil fuels um that's why i joked at the beginning of the year like oh fossil fuels aren't actually made out of like dinosaur fossils like we all think that's because fossil fuels came up during the carboniferous period not when the dinosaurs were around so um yeah but again all great things must come to an end the permian mass extinction so this comes at the end of the permian period which is in the late paleozoic era about 250 million years ago um we don't know much about this one which is awful <laughs> um but Something between methane, basalt, and the air eventually just suffocating life um, and leading to very quick climate change. So whether it was an asteroid strike, um, lots of volcanic activity, which led to climate change, and then microbes, so like uh, viruses and things like that, this is what ends an era because 96% of all species on Earth are wiped out. Again, you think of our team of 100, four survived this. That is it. This is the extinction of all extinctions. Um, and why we then can say we move out of the Paleozoic era and into the next one. Um, You'll have noticed that the Paleozoic era was made up of about six periods. Um, time gets much, much smaller as we move forward um, because more significant change occurs, um, but also less death in a way. So uh, the Permian extinction is the largest of all extinctions. 96% of all species on Earth, that is land, and water were completely wiped out. Um, and life was just starting to get big. Um, so I don't remember the name of this. It's a reptile too. It's not a dinosaur because those are coming. Um, but this was kind of our leapfrog into the dinosaur. So the Mesozoic era, this is our age of dinosaurs. 
Um, we have the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods um, from about 250 million years ago to 65.5 million years ago. This is what everyone was probably like, oh, this is what we're going to talk about. Pangea starts to break apart at this um, time, um, kind of during the late Triassic. Uh, so dinosaur life really started after that great Permian extinction. Um, and clearly life was able to come back and it came back big. Um, and then Pangea started to happen um, and the breaking away of that. Many inland seas started to form, creating these new coastal environments for marine life to evolve. Um, so then we start getting the difference between freshwater and seawater and, um, oh my goodness, brash, brash, brackish water, things like that, where it's part sea, part, yeah, clearly not in hydrologist. Um, so that, then you start getting mammals. This is the first time we're talking mammals. Um, remember, mammals are those whom um, carry their young internally, and they birth them, like, alive, okay? That versus everything else to this point has either been amphibian or reptilian, meaning that they are hat laying eggs that have to be incubated and then they birth okay so that so like i said mesozoic is the age of the dinosaurs they start taking off but they haven't even reached their peak yet um in the early portion of the triassic then there's a mass extinction because why not why not um, at the end of the Jurassic period of the Mesozoic, about 200 million years ago, um, there was lots of um, volcanic activity happening. You have Pangaea splitting apart. Like, think back to our geoscience processes. There's a lot of volcanic activity, earthquake activity, possible fires, things like that all going on because of all this shifting. Um, so that global climate change then comes of it, which then leads to a change in pH and um, sea levels of our oceans. Um, things aren't awful at this point um, because 50% of life was wiped out. So half, not great, but not 96. Um, they... Paleontologists also believe that this is because it was a combination of a lot of smaller extinctions that happened over like the continuation of 18 million years. So this one was just the end all be all sort of a thing um, to where probably far more life was lost, but enough life was able to come back of it um, and evolve with it, which then allowed for the smaller loss of life when like major poop hit the fan. Now, <laughs> this is the part where it's like, oh, this is really disappointing, G. We don't talk much about dinosaurs, but we have to understand that between the um, Triassic and Jurassic, there's not a lot of dinosaurs. Um, there's these weird little leapfrog sort of organisms. Um, dinosaurs really take off during the Cretaceous period. Um, and when they take off, they take off big, big. Um, that's what makes the next slide really, really sad for me. And that is the KT extinction. Um, so life started getting really, really big. We have our Brontosaurus, our Plesiosaurus, our Ankylosaurus, our Trian... Um, Tyrannosaurus Rex, like we have all of those major players. Like I could go get a stack of cards that Will has in here. That's all these different um, reptilian avian sort of organisms um, that just were too big for their britches. Um, so what happened is about 65 million years ago, 
end of the Cretaceous period and what would then be the end of the Mesozoic era, um, there was an extreme asteroid and meteor impact um, that occurred. Through this, and I don't want to say too terribly much more because after our assessment, there's a whole thing we'll watch that goes into it. But essentially what happened is if they were not killed upon impact of these extraterrestrial <laughs> objects, um, the intense climate change, sudden intense climate change, would wipe out 75% of all life. Oceanic and terrestrial. Um, and because the dinosaurs were so large, they just, they couldn't. They couldn't, and because they're reptilian, they couldn't deal with how cold it got. This essentially leads into an ice age um, to where scientists have deemed it as the impact winter. Um, the picture in this bottom one, that little white chalky line, maybe two finger widths thick, that is what we call the KT boundary. Um, this is why we can say 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs all went extinct due to one mass extinction, um, because that is our line that shows that mass extinction. There are zero dinosaurs above that line and all the dinosaurs below it. Um, and really dinosaurs only during that Cretaceous period. That's why like Jurassic Park, like all this, it's all happening in the wrong period. But Jurassic sounds far better than Cretaceous Park. Um, so yeah. So this is probably the one that like gets me the most. Ugh. But this is our last major documented extinction. But it leads us into the Cenozoic era. This is from 65.5 million years ago until present day. Um, currently, there's only two periods, the tertiary and the quaternary. Uh, Quarterary, quaternary, quaternary, I don't know how you pronounce all these all the time, but um, let's talk about them a little bit more and how they might actually be expanding. So the Cenozoic is from 65.5 million years ago until present. We identify it as the quaternary and the tertiary periods. Um, these are subdivided into epochs. Um, so this is the first time we're getting into epochs, and that's because this has far better documentation geolo uh, geologic-wise, um, but also it involves humans. So, of course, we're always more focused on us. Um, so that we are a part of the Hallocene epoch. Just a little fun factoid for you, which actually might be different by the time you guys are a little bit older. Um, I hope to see it within my lifetime, but I'll explain why here in a bit. So the tertiary period, so from 65.5 million years ago till 2.6 million years ago, this is where we get the Pleistocene Epoch, the Eocene Epoch, and the Oligocene, Oligocene Epoch. Um, so what happens here is that during this early part, the Earth was warm. We're finally warming up after the great mass extinction of the dinosaurs. But during the Middle Eocene Epoch, we start to notice the cooling. And this is because the continents are starting to get where they are present day, which means Antarctica has moved from basically up near the equator down to the South Pole, meaning it's holding a lot more um, ice on it, keeping our atmosphere a little bit cooler. This is where we start seeing some really weird but cool mammals appearing. Um, you get more things like jackals and um, like descendants of the lions and tigers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and modern day elephant. 
um, sort of a thing. The quaternary period um, involves the Miocene epoch, the Pliocene, the Pleistocene, and the Holocene epochs. Um, so that is from about 2.6 billion years until today. Um, this is where we start getting into our Great Ice Age. Um, and now, don't get me wrong, ice ages have happened prior to this, but this is what is important because it defines who we become. Um, so because glaciers begin to grow and advancing, lowering sea levels, bringing on that ice age, Homo sapiens begin to evolve during the Pleistocene epoch. Um, the climate begins to warm during the Holocene epoch, leading to the extinction of many mega mammals, um, including the woolly mammoth and mastodons. Um, saber toothed tigers go away, <laughs> like all that kind of stuff. Everything kind of like shrinks down. Um, yeah, to where it really, it all becomes about humans. And that is why a lot of scientists believe that we're actually moving into the next epoch, if not potentially an entirely new period. Um, and it's going to be the age of computer. Um, so Holocene, I believe, literally comes down to um, the age of human. Um, but we're now quickly moving into the age of computer. Um, I don't remember what they want to call it. It's in the video. I do know that, but I don't remember what they want to or what it's going to be called eventually. But I would expect within my lifetime, if not for sure yours, they actually make that great divide. Um, but with that comes another great extinction, because anytime you want to move from Pleistocene into Holocene, you have to see things go, um, and things go significantly. Um, now, I'm not saying the humans are going to be wiped out, clearly, um, but rather, ooh, this leads me back into the beginning where it's like, scientists believe that there have been six great extinctions, or we're in the sixth great extinction. Um, and that's because the amount of different species and organisms that we have seen completely die out during our lifetimes is ridiculous. There, I want to say, have been over one million species of amphibian alone that have completely gone by the wayside. Um, if you look at the endangered species list, or the extinct species list. I mean, we have things like black rhinoceros that there's one or two left. Um, so that's where scientists are trying to identify, are we within that sixth extinction or has that sixth extinction happened during the documented history of humans? Um, and we would be able to identify that we, we do know what the problem was it wasn't a meteor impact. It was climate change, but it was climate change due to human activity and how that then led to where they are at that point or today. Um, kind of makes you put a little bit of a different look at how we use things, how we do things, and why we now would be moving out of the age of human into the age of computer. So that's 4.6 billion years, kind of summed up. Um, I would love to spend more time talking about dinosaurs, obviously, I'm a big fan, um, but I think it's important to understand where we have come from to be able to see where we're going, knowing that with change, there comes, I don't even know how you want to put it, death, essentially. So hopefully 
whatever we have done or are doing, we're able to not necessarily reverse, but slow down. Let's slow it down. Um, and all that kind of fun jazz. I, yeah, it'd be cool to be like, hey, we're no longer in the Hellsene epoch. We're now in this epoch sort of thing. But also like, oh, that's, that's scary. So, yeah, just kind of here to bum you out. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. <laughs> I'll try my best to answer them. Um, your notes should be done and turned in. And there is your last exit ticket that you should take a peek at, please, and get submitted in as well. Yeah, that's all I got. Um, reach out if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone.